So today we have two fabulous contributors to talk to us about bread. Dr. Katrina Clear lectures in modern history at National University of Ireland, Galway. She's published on nuns, women's household work, poverty, oral history, and women's magazines, and is now looking at Irish popular fiction in the first half of the 20th century. But she has found for the past 25 years or so that all roads lead her back to cook, author, and broadcaster Maura Laverty, to whom she has what can only be called a devotion. <laughs> she's generally recognised as the queen of Irish social history. She's opened up perspectives on Irish women's lives in the 20th century with her meticulous research and her feel for domestic, religious and writing lives. She's going to talk to us about her idol, Mary Maura Laverty. Now, we might, I don't think our picture has managed to get through. There was a photograph of her. Did you get to manage it, Mike? You're a great genius. That's wonderful. <laughs> to be able to see what she looked like, which is very important. So, Maura Laverty was probably the most famous cook in Ireland before Dorina Allen. She was the Nigella of her period. And what strategies she used for dealing with bread during the 1940s. Jerry Godley has recently set up a community bakery called Bread Man Walking. When it comes to being, and he has a hashtag and all those things, you can look him up and see what he's at. When it comes to being a baker, he's taken the long way round. In his 20s, he was a chef in good kitchens in Dublin and London. In his 30s, he was a musician playing saxophones and jazz and Latin bands. He says about himself he was no Charlie Parker, but he enjoyed modest success and had a good time. That led to the business side of music, and over the next two decades, he produced concerts, curated festivals in Ireland and internationally, presented jazz and world music programs uh, for RTE, and was very active around advocacy for the arts when the banks crashed in 08. I actually first met Jerry in Kilkenny when he was curating the... Uh, modern music strand of that festival. And he had the most extraordinary people that we'd never heard of and all loved when we saw them. Very, very good taste in music. Higher education came next and he spent the last six years as principal at the Leeds Conservatoire, one of the UK's elite performing arts schools, commuting weekly between Dublin and Leeds and made a huge success of it. I mean, if you look it up, uh, he turned the place around in those six years and it's become a sort of cutting edge uh, educational institution. COVID brought him back to Ireland permanently and with it an opportunity to question the things that were important to him. Throughout the music years, food remained a true north and immersing his hands in flour proved to be the answer, slowly, patiently, acquiring the intuition and dexterity that is the hallmark of the baker's craft, fashioning loaves good and true from flour, salt and water to be enjoyed in homes in his local community of Dublin 8. And I have had the privilege of having dinner in Jerry's house, most magnificent food. He's a tremendously good cook. He's endlessly curious about the place of food in our world, and we're not baking. He's studying for a master's in Irish food culture in UCC with the eminent food historian Regina Sexton. And he's still trying to get better at the saxophone. Jerry knows everything about the history and chemistry of bread, so we're going to start with a whirlwind tour through that history. Then Katrina will talk about household conditions in the 1940s, what kinds of bread were available, what else people were eating, and how the Nigella of her time, more elaborately, dealt with the bread problem. Then we're back to Jerry for an up-to-date account of where we stand now with regard to grain in Ireland, some of which he has here and shall mill for your edification, turning the grain into beautiful flour. So he's very interesting on the subject of who controls grain, who has intellectual property rights to it, uh, and what we can bake with the grains that we have here in Ireland. And he will tell us about the white slice pan. It won't be edifying, I can tell you now. <laughs> but bread tasting like Kleenexes, an understatement. He'll, and he'll be milling the grains, as I said. There'll be bread for the audience uh, shortly. If I can control these two brilliantly informed people, we will have time for questions uh, from yourselves. I'm not sure I can control them, but I'm, they're, they're, they're going to be well behaved. That they are, aren't you? Yeah, yep. you are. <laughs> Okay, Jerry, into your whirlwind tour, history, economics, politics, okay. and philosophy of bread. No pressure. Thanks very much, Katrina. Um, do I need to turn anything on here? Can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Um, this feels very shopping channel. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but look, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, blessed among Katrinas as I am. Uh, I'm a little sleep deprived after the 4 a.m. start this morning to bake bread for, for my customers in Dublin 8. In fact, interestingly, one of my customers is here, and she asked me to bring her bread, so I have it here. <laughs> ah, that's great. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what you call customer Lovely. service. You know? um, I'm, I, so I'm, I've negotiated 12 minutes from, from Katrina to offer a kind of baker's perspective, and, and I'd like to talk about the first 12 minutes, actually, in the life of this loaf of bread. It came out of the oven about 6 a.m. this morning, and we're going to eat it later. Um, I say loaf, but actually what went into the oven was dough. What came out was bread, and that distinction is important. The first thing Louis Pasteur 
observed through his microscope in, 18, in the 1860s was yeasts. And really prior to that, we viewed this transformative process. Indeed, for some people, it's a transubstantive process of turning flour and water into bread as a kind of branch of magic. <coughs> and maybe in some ways it still is magic. So anyway, after 12 minutes, this sourdough loaf had reached the impressively named thermal death point. And that's a term that originates in the canning industry. But basically, it's the point at which uh, the surface of, the, of the, the bread had reached about 60, 65 degrees centigrade. And beyond that point, all the microbial activity going on inside it has ceased. So the, the lactic acid bacteria, the, 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 the yeast cultures, all of the agents that are kind of transforming the form and the volume of the loaf, they're all dead, and they're dead because I killed them, right? So, uh, and, and as you can see, this, this moment of microbial death, it's kind of frozen in time here in the profile of the, of the loaf. This is sometimes called, this is called an ear, and this is, it's called the belly of the loaf. Um, and it, it, it's, 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 it, if you look closer, you can actually see the gluten strands, right? You can see that the gluten strands are kind of, they're following this kind of beautiful linear, this kind of waveform, because gluten does that. It organizes itself into a network. And, but any time I look at this, I think about that painting, The Great Wave, by the no, great Japanese artist, Takasai, or, or like a pyroplastic lava flow in Iceland. It's like a moment frozen in time. Now, beyond 65 degrees, the bread keeps on baking. There's, there's loads of chemical uh, re reactions happening. There's sugars are, are caramelizing the crust. Starches are gelatinizing to form the internal structure. Amino acids are presenting themselves to create lovely umami flavors in what's known as the Maillard action, similar to what you get on a good steak when it's been seared um, really well. Um, all that stuff is great, right? Uh, you know, bread science, thermal mechanics, chemical reactions, but we will not be going down the rabbit hole of bread science here because, trust me, that way lies madness. <laughs> right? um, but, but I want to dwell on those wild yeasts um, for, for a little minute because they've now sort of sacrificed themselves in this kind of trial by fire because isn't that what the oven is? It's a trial by fire. And in fact, isn't that what our, you know, our food and agriculture is? We kill plants and vegetables and animals in order that we may live. That's our history of food. So those yeasts are dead, but they've not died in vain because they've helped transform the flour and water into the extraordinary life force that is bread. And that sort of death and birth and renewal ad infinitum is the story of bread. Okay, bread's made from flour. Flour is made from wheat. But what is wheat? It's a question. <laughs> what, what, what is wheat? Yeah, yeah, but where does the grain come from? Grass, right? Wheat, 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 is, wheat is grass, right? And we take the berries or the seeds from that grass and we make flour from it. And those seeds are like life ca capsules. They're like miraculous little lifeboats packed with everything the endosperm could need on its perilous journey to wherever it's going to germinate next. But when we harvest it and dry it and we pulverize it in mills, we, we deny it that opportunity for life. We, we kill again, right? So now the, the, now the seed is in a state of kind of stasis, a kind of purgatorial state. But we can bring the seed back to life when we hydrate it. So by mixing it with water and, and some kind of agent like yeast, um, we, can, we can activate those proteins again, all the proteins and enzymes that are locked inside the lifeboat. Um, we, can, we can give them a new purpose to raise our bread to leaven our bread, and that word leaven comes from to enliven. So life finds a way again. And then, as I said earlier, we kill it again in the oven. But of course, what comes out of the oven is in itself a source of life for us. It's fuel for the wild ride our species has been on, fuel for our extraordinary population growth, our, our greatest achievements, and our grubbiest mi misdeeds. In fact, for the longest time, it fueled us working in the fields where we would sow the seed for the next harvest and the cycle of life and death would continue into perpetuity, or so we hoped, because now our habitat is reaching its own thermal death point and we're not so sure about that future. But given all this symbolic power in bread, it's no great surprise then that the carpenter from Nazareth chose it as the ultimate somewhat hyperbolic symbol of the faith. But as in other tenets of Christianity, the faith was simply aggregating the bread lore and mythology from the animistic faiths that it was competing with. So, for example, like the Roman god Ceres, who's a sort of bread and agriculture god. But the Romans, in turn, had appropriated from the Greeks 
bread, or rather wheat, is a vital force in Greek mythology, and it's enshrined in Demeter, the goddess of all things of the earth. So when Hades takes her daughter, Persephone, to the underworld for part of every year, her autumn departure, which is, by the way, celebrated around September, when the wheat seed is being sown, is a symbol of the seed being cast into and under the earth, only to return in the spring as wheat, just as Persephone does. Um, Persephone is slim-ankled, just like the elegant stalk of wheat. Persephone is wheat. So the Greek scholars among you here, uh, now that we're here in NUIG, will know that this comes from the, the Eleusinian mysteries. And th this was a very secretive cult that worshipped um, Demeter. And there's recent archaeological evidence that says that the really practical secret they were guarding, on pain of death, I might add, was to do with procedures and techniques for storing grain so they'd have sufficient wheat seed to ensure successful ongoing harvests. And this was really practical information that gave the, gave the Greeks great strategic advantage over their neighbours, because control of wheat brings enormous power, and that control can be weaponized, as we see in the war in Ukraine. Now, all of this is kicking off 3,500 years ago. Bread's already well established by then. The Egyptians had earlier discovered bread and beer. Yay! <laughs> um, a pairing that is no coincidence, by the way, because they both rely on a group of yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, as in cerveza, the Spanish word for beer. So out of the millions and millions of yeast that exist, this small handful are particularly well disposed to humankind, and we rely on them for most of our fermented foods, from cheese and wine to bread and beer. Now, I think we'd all agree that more so than the pyramids, this Egyptian discovery added greatly to the sum of human happiness because the bread that preceded it would have been a really dense, heavy affair, more like a cooked porridge, and probably not unlike the oat cakes that com until comparatively recently were a staple in the Irish diet. Um, but bread goes back even further. There's other recent archaeological finds identifying the Natufians. Now, these were people that lived between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in, in what is modern-day Iraq. And there, there's evidence of them making bread 9,000 years ago. And, of course, that's in the part of the world known as the Fertile Crescent, where agriculture started and thus civilization started. And other useful stuff that came from the Fertile Crescent includes the wheel and the written world. Right? So I've probably been talking for seven or eight minutes now, and we're <laughs> at about 7,000 BC. So I realize this is this not particularly helpful for our current predicament, because right now we're very anxious about wheat um, as a consequence of this nihilistic war in Ukraine. But we should draw some scant comfort from the bread history, which tells us that it was ever thus. Bread is delicious, and bread is contentious. Empires and civilizations rise and fall with the bounty of their wheat, from the bread and circuses that Katrina mentioned, to Napoleon's armies starving on the retreat from uh, Moscow for lack of bread, and of course America. America's emergence as a superpower when the railways connected the, the, wheat, the wheat prairies in the, in the Midwest to the coastal ports, and from thence their grain flooded the world, and America accrued vast wealth and, and, and influence, and it primed, wheat primed America's 20th century. So bread is also a site of resistance. When Europe was being convulsed by peasant revolts through the Middle Ages, a consistent aspect of their demands was the right to mill the grain they had grown themselves. The nobilities fought ruthlessly to retain these monopolies because it was such an effective way to control the untermensch. Uh, and, and, you know, this has echoes actually in the control exerted on today's commodity grain, where just four companies you've never heard of control 90% of grain supply on the planet. Has anybody ever heard of any of these companies? Nope. No? They're called, they're, they're called Archer Daniels Midland, Bunge, Cargill, and Louis, Dreyf Louis, Louis Dreyfus. They're collectively known as the ABCD companies. So grain has its own plutocrats, just like big tech, big oil, and all the other bigs. Right? Um, and I, now, I don't know about you, but huge corporations that control access to basic necessities with a global footprint and vested interests in maintaining the status quo scare me shitless. Right? Mm. So, so now it's in our nature to view food and its many pleasures as a distraction from life's many wicked problems. But actually, food might be the most wicked problem of them all. Food production is the planet's biggest carbon emitter, uh, yet 30% of that output goes directly to landfill. 30% of our food production goes to waste. And that spoiled food alone accounts for 8% of global carbon emissions. So we have 850 million that lack the 
basic nu daily nutritional needs on the planet. So it's telling us that something's really wrong with our food systems and our supply chains. And the industrial bread system, sadly, is no exception. <clears throat> and it sometimes seems to me that all the ills and anxieties of the modern world uh, converge on the sliced pan, in a way, with apologies to, to Mrs. Johnston, Mooney, O'Brien, uh, Pat the Baker, and L, Mr. Brennan. <laughs> um, so I'm nearly, I'm nearly done here. Um, but, but when I started baking as, as bread man walking, I didn't realize I was also joining a global insurrection. And actually, I see some of my fellow bakers in the audience tonight. But it's, it's very exciting to be part of an idea whose time has come again. And the idea is simple. Bread made in small batches close to where you live made by a human who can account for what's inside it. And more encouraging still is the nascent revival in the farming and milling of the heritage brains that grew abundantly on these islands 100 years ago. And, and actually, I've used some of that Irish grain in this soda bread, and we're going to mill a little bit of grain as well. Um, you know, this tabletop mill here, the, sh the shopping channel bit, um, so I'm going to mill a little bit of this grain. It comes from a, a farmer called Danani. Danani flower, they're up in, in Toher, uh, up there in uh, County Louth, and it's a variety of wheat called torp. And when you smell this grain just after it's been milled, it's just, a, it's just beautiful. It's floral and really beautiful. So um, we'll mill this bit of grain. It'll be our, our little part in the, the uh, our little act of rebellion, uh, our little act of grain citizenship. I realize it's not quite Gandhi spinning his cloth, but it, it's, a, it's a start. Um, to conclude, uh, bread is a constant in our lives, but our attitudes towards it are always in flux. Bread has currency, but it has become debased in our lifetimes, subjected to industrial processes that have drained its wholesome essence as a source of, source of both energy and pleasure. Bread is profound. It's not a product or a staple or a household basic or a cheap filler or a handy snack or a housewife's choice, whatever they are, uh, or a family favorite. It's food. It's the food, right? So more than any other technology, it has aided the progress of our species. I use that word advisedly. Um, it's woven into our harvest rituals and, and religious practices. It's freighted with significance for diasporas and their migrations. It's intensely political and a lightning rod for social upheaval from the French Revolution to the Arab Spring. And it's a racing certainty there's more of that coming our way when the grain silos in the developing world start to run low, probably before the year is out. Um, bread must be very precious then, but actually it's the food that we discard uneaten the most. 41% of Irish households say it's the food that they throw away most often. Bread is modest to a fault, a marvel hiding in, bread, bread, in plain sight. It's the handmaid to billions of meals taking place every second across this crowded planet, from communion wafers to drunken late-night kebabs, from prison campaign, camp, canteens to three-star Michelin joints. Uh, it's steeped in history and culture. It's a metaphorical shorthand for, every, as Katrina beautifully pointed out, it's a metaphorical shorthand for everything from you know, uh, um, everlasting life to the money in your pocket. And in these volatile times, it's also a motif for our precarious world from the inequalities within our food system and the, 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 the vagaries of wheat supply itself. And finally, to make it with your own hands is to connect with the hard lives our ancestors led and marvel at the magical cooperation between man and microbe that has for millennia raised each and every loaf, just as I had the pleasure of doing with this loaf this morning. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Jerry, you're a marvel, and you stuck to your time, which is just so pleased with yeah, you. I hope I do the same now. Yeah, you will, of course. No bother. <laughs> so Katrina is going to talk to us about uh, I'm going to stand up as household, well behind household this. life during the emergency, and we are going to talk about more elaborate. So, Mike, if you have those two uh, scans up there. That is, tell them about this. Um, That's from Katrina. her book, Kind Cooking, 1946, published by Kerry Mann, which I'll be talking about in a moment. And I'll be reading out a little bit of a quote from it. And you had a picture of her as well, did you? Yeah, Mike yeah. managed to rescue that from the internet. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, there she I, is. Yeah, there that's she her. That's Thanks a million, Mike. That's great. So she has now, an interrogative face, as you can see. She was. About very... to ask a question. Yeah. Right. Off you go. Um, in Maura Leverty's first novel, 
which was set in early 20th century Kildare, Never No More, The Story of a Lost Village, pub but published in 1942, and that's an important date. In that novel, the grandmother is the fount of all wisdom on cooking and baking, and both processes are described in detail in the book. But every so often, she lapses into lists, and for a neighbour's wedding, Gran, around 1920 in the action of the book, Gran bakes, quote, white bread, brown bread, Indian meal bread and bran loaves, short cakes, butter cakes and scones of all kinds, seed cakes and sundae cakes and prune cakes, apple cakes and flummery. And she bakes a lot of other things as well. Now, Never No More was published in Britain, although it was available in Ireland. It wasn't banned, but it sold much better in Britain than it did here in Ireland. It went into several editions up to the early 1950s. It has a lovely, simple story about a kind of a coming of age. But I'd say its lush and loving descriptions of food preparation and consumption appealed greatly to people at a time of shortage. And remember, rationing continued in Britain until the early 1950s. Now, rationing wasn't quite as severe in Ireland between 1939 and 1945, but it existed, as Katrina has pointed out. And it was notable enough that we had our own version of the British wartime song, Bless Them All, which went, Bless De Valera and Sean McEntee for giving us the black bread and the half ounce mm. of tea. <laughs> now, the bread wasn't really black. It was more a kind of a dirty grey, and so was the flour. But the fact that Irish people were complaining about the quality of the bread, because this was a complaint, by the way, they weren't really blessing the Valera, it shows how important <laughs> it was to them. The potato, as we all know, was the main daily carbohydrate from about 1720 to, we'll say, 1890. But before this, Irish people ate oats and some wheat and bread and some barley, as well as a lot of other foods as well, root vegetables, dairy produce and meat. But even when eating potatoes was almost universal, many people in Ulster and North Connacht also ate plenty of oats. And in Leinster and East Munster and Ulster as well, wheat and barley were part of the diet. And it was only among the very small, poor smallholders and cottiers that the potato was the only foodstuff. And this made them fatally vulnerable, of course, to the blight of the 1840s. But even by the 1840s, in the growing towns and cities, commercial bakeries baking yeast bread were developing. The smallest towns had bakeries. And they continued to do so from then on. And then some historians say from the early 19th century, but I think Regina Sexton and a few others say that from around the 1850s, commercially developed bicarbonate of soda became cheap to buy, and Irish country people started going to shops more, and city people. So rural women with a surplus of buttermilk and after churning began making soda bread. So soda bread really dates only back to about the 1840s, 1850s, probably 1850s. They often bought the, the flour and bleached the bags and used them for several purposes around the house. Although in tillage part of the countries, farming people brought their own grain to the mill to have it ground. Now, there was a tradition of yeast bread in parts of the country, and even, but even here it seems, and partic but particularly in the West, many women from the 19th century onwards baked for their families several soda cakes a week, always called cakes, to distinguish, and, and that's why cake, country people often call cake, sweet cake. One lady I interviewed, who was born in Mayo in 1931, told me that soda bread was such an everyday thing when she was a child, that's in the late 30s, early 40s, that white loaf yeast bread, or town bread, as she called it, with jam, was a weekend treat as good as cake. This wasn't a poverty narrative. They weren't poor, but it was just that soda bread was every day. Now, the National Nutrition Survey carried out in the late 1940s found variations in diet all over the country. But one thing it found was that everywhere, in the country and in the towns, bread and spread was eaten at every meal, including dinner. Margarine or jam, of course, often substituted for butter. And the bread eaten could have been soda bread or yeast bread. Remember as well that up to the mid-1970s, not only rural people ate their dinner in the middle of the day, but many children and workers in towns and cities came home from school or work in the middle of the day for their dinner. And so the evening meal, or the tea, was when the greatest quantity of bread was consumed. A plate of it was cut and placed in the middle of the table, while the meal itself was ham and tomatoes, eggs, rashers, sausages. Whatever. Sounds great. Um, which? Sounds great. Oh, I know, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Tony Kiley's original research on what Dublin city people ate in the 1950s no doubt also applies to the 1940s and to other cities and towns as well. Most working class households, he said, had three cooking implements, a pot for stew, a frying pan and a bread knife. 
Bread, like all foods, was bought as it was needed. In Moral Averty's fourth novel, Lift Up Your Gates, published in 1946, and Band, another story, Chrissy, a teenager living in Dublin's tenements, carries the bread she buys at the shop home in an old washed pillowcase. The bread had to be covered so that people wouldn't know your business. Buying too little bread or yesterday's bread sold at certain times of the day could imply that you were hard up. Buying too much that you hadn't the fuel to cook a proper meal. Laverty doesn't spell this out and she doesn't have to. I'm sure everybody of my, a lot of people of my generation and background will remember this intense privacy about the family's food consumption, and that extended to bread as well. Now, that's my second mention of Maura Laverty, so I'd better introduce her. She was born Maura Kelly in Rathangan in County Kildare in 1907. Her mother was a dressmaker who ran a drapery shop. Maura went to boarding school to the Bridget Ines in Tullow, County Carlow, and then to Spain for four years, where she began as a governess but quickly moved on to other kinds of work. She came back to Ireland in 1928, married James Laverty at the age of 21, and she went straight into broadcasting and journalism. She had a books programme in the 1930s, interviewing, among others, T.S. Eliot, but was, well, was enough of an authority on household affairs, she also had a household radio programme, for the government to commission her to write a very short cookery book in 1941, Flower Economy. This is a factual little publication with none of the flourishes that would later distinguish Laverty's food writing. No stories, no anecdotes. It was all about how to use less flour by using more potatoes and oatmeal. So potato bread, potato scones, potato flapjacks, oatmeal bread, German oat cakes, slices of cold porridge cut and fried on the pan, and so on. Now, these recipes are ones very like them. were also promoted on the BBC and in cheap British wartime publications, and many of these have been republished in recent years by the Imperial War Museum. She may have cogged them off the BBC, I don't know. <laughs> Cooks are always doing this kind of thing. By the time Laverty wrote her second cookery book, Kind Cooking, published in 1946, as I said, rationing in Ireland had eased somewhat and she could write about bread again. Where did Laverty learn her cookery? She gives the impression in all her writings that this was lore that she learned at home. But when I interviewed her sister, the late sister Conleth Kelly, 20 years ago, Sister Conleth told me that their mother had little time for cooking, being so busy in the shop and dressmaking. Anyway, Maura was away in boarding school for a lot of the years she would have been learning and cooking, and then she went to Spain at 17. In the afterword to Never Know More, her first novel, the one I mentioned earlier, Laverty acknowledges Florence Irwin's Irish Country Recipes, first published in Belfast, 1937. Beautiful book. And I've also found some of the bread and cake recipes Laverty refers to in both her novels and her cookery writings. In Josephine Reddington's Economic Cookery Book, first published by Gill in Dublin in 1905 and still in use in the 1940s. Folklorist Breed Mahan tells us that Laverty was a regular visitor to the folklore archives looking for food lore. And of course, Laverty was the mother of a family. So like most of us, she learned on the job by trial and error. But she was not only a self-taught cook, and she, she confessed in kind cooking that the only letters after her name would be R.I.P. <laughs> she had enough sophistication to appreciate traditional Irish food, both for its nutritional value and cultural significance. And I just want to read what she says about bread. You talked about leaven and levity there earlier, Jerry. Uh, this is from Kind Cooking. Leaven and levity do not go well together. Bread is a subject to be approached with reverence. There's a bit of ellipsis here. <laughs> As children, we were told that to waste food of any kind was a sin which must be told in confession, but to waste bread was a sacrilege. If we threw a crust into the ashes, we were warned that before we'd die, retributive hunger would make us follow a crow seven miles in the hope that he would drop just such a crust. <laughs> in Offaly, the scrap of dough they keep back from one leaven to the next is known as blessed bread. Should bread drop onto the floor in Spain, it's picked up and kissed before being replaced on the table. Not to do so would be to lose the chance of helping a poor soul out of purgatory. I've been told that by those who should know that from the earliest times, bread has been worshipped as a symbol of fertility. That may be true. I prefer to believe that bread is of special importance to us because of the way it has been honoured above all other things on earth. End quote. She's referring here, of course, to the, the Eucharist. But note also has her referring to a, a reference to a tradition of sourdough baking in, in, in Offaly probably gleaned from the archives, or maybe remembered, because Kildare borders awfully. She also has a very spiritual poem about wheat, uh, which heads off her 1960 book, the one that we're all familiar with, but which was actually written in the 1920s. In her 1942 <coughs> novel, Never No More, she describes <coughs> picking an ear of wheat in a wheat field and blessing herself with it three times. 
That's what they were taught to do as children. Now, Leverty was popular. There can be no doubt about that. Women wrote into her from all over the country when she had a cookery page on the Irish press in 1946. And before and after this, they wrote into her when she had a programme on the radio. And remember that even before rural electrification, wirelesses were often acquired by houses that didn't have electricity because they could be run on a wet battery or a dry battery. Leverty had a beautiful writing style, a very engaging and self-deprecating persona. And I think her adaptation of Irish tradition for a modernising audience may have instigated a soda bread revival among townswomen in this period. I can say more about this later if anyone's interested. It's just a theory I have. But, you know, to remember that women of the house <coughs> are as innovative, were as innovative and imaginative as any other artisans at the time. In kind cooking, she remarks that Ireland has given a four-leaf shamrock to the world. One is W.B. Yeats, another is Barry Fitzgerald. Yet another is boiled potatoes in their jackets. And the fourth is soda bread, quote, and the greatest of these is soda bread, end quote. She gives a very useful recipe for winter buttermilk made out of raw potatoes and mashed potatoes covered with water and left in a warm place for seven days. She says she got this from Cork and Mead. And it was used not only by townspeople who haven't buttermilk and who can't afford to let new milk go sour. Because remember, milk, you know, people had to buy milk. You couldn't always be letting it go sour to make bread. But it could also be used by country people in winter when the cows weren't giving enough milk to make it worthwhile to churn. And this winter buttermilk actually works. My mother, who was city born and bred, made brown soda bread all through her married life. Like all the other mothers on our estate, actually, they did that as well. But she used to have a winter buttermilk plant as well. Regarding yeast bread, Leverty advises that to get into a good rhythm of kneading yeast bread, you should sing a song in waltz time. Um, I tried this. Um, it didn't work. But that could have been my fault. My sister says I'm too impatient and my house is too cold. Jerry tells me you have to be at it for years and years. Anyway, I think maybe the flour was different then. That's my excuse. So I'm going to leave it there and maybe people might have questions later. Thank you. Wonderful, Katrina. Thank you. Oh, water, oh, lovely. Oh, very Excellent. nice. Thanks. Um, Jerry. Yeah. Back to the present. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want you to tell people all about the bite size pan because when you told oh, me yeah. I nearly oh, fell yeah. out of my chair. Yeah. But the, the, you've told us a little about the, the uh, ownership of IP rights to grain by four multinational corporations. Yeah. Yeah. Elaborate on that a bit and tell us who the refuseniks are, the revolutionaries yeah. Yeah. who are so, trying to do something else. So. Um, the grain in the EU, um, and indeed, if there's anybody you know from a kind of farming or agro agronomist amongst us, you know, please feel free to pitch in and correct my amateurish take on this because it's it's um, I come at it from a baker's perspective, but it's a, it's a real eye opener. So, um, grain within the EU is is subject to something called the dust laws. So that means that the grains have to be it's something like distinct, unique. Uh, secure and traceable, right? And and that's the kind of mo for the kind of IP of a of, of a grain. And it's a very kind of prescribed environment where, um, I mean, what what I'm informed, and indeed of one of my fellow bakers here, and we were down at Clock Jordan recently, v v meeting somebody from Tall of Bio, who are an organisation of seed savers here, and the seed savers are the refuseniks. But I'll come to them in a sec. Um, so effectively, it's quite a prescribed um, space. Uh, uh, tillage farmers have very little latitude around what grains um, they're going to be uh, planting. It's pretty much prescribed. You know, a body like Chagas, for example, might, you know, say, look, these are these are the grains that you're planting for this season, and mm. you know, th that's it. You know, it's a kind of very limited um, situation. Now, these are grains that are planted. These are grains that have been cultivated for disease resistance and yield, which are all very good things, but actually um, for other qualities you might want like nutrient density or flavor profile and things like that those those things don't really come into the picture so if you want to step outside of that right if you want to step outside of that particular system and i think a system is a very good way to describe it i mean in one of the more pernicious aspects of it right so you you consider you're a grain farmer right and you've you've planted and say you're holding back 30 percent of your harvest for planting the following year. Well, under these regulations, you're required to pay a, li uh, to pay a royalty 
on that seed that you've saved back to Cargill or Bunge or, Ma or Monsanto. Sure. So yeah. it's, it's an extraordinary kind of situation. Um, so if you want to opt out of that, what, what do you do? Well, you, you do what um, growers like Donani are doing, and there are other growers here like Ballybrado and Irish Organic Mills and some others that don't come to mind. Um, you work with people like, there's a brilliant pair of brothers, Finton and Turlock Keenan. So Finton Keenan has been working, on, is a farmer from Monaghan. His brother far, far, is a tillage farmer, uh, also in Monaghan. And he has been working on all sorts of kind of gene editing and plant husbandry that is basically about bringing back the heritage grains. Because going back to the earlier point about it being grass, you know, wheat was very kind of, in, wheat is indigenous to wherever it, wherever it grows. But these these wheats fell from grace because they didn't deliver the yield. So there's a great deal amount of work going on to uh, um, improve upon these strains. So these would be strains like einkorn and emmer and things like that. The old, I mean, einkorn means the one corn. It's mm. the oldest wheat. Um, so, uh, I mean, because I, I, I wanted a gold star, Katrina, I spoke to the chairman of the Irish Grain Growers Association yesterday. He was a guy called Bobby Miller. Oh, you got a uh, gold star for that. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah. And Bobby Miller, yeah, yeah it had to be. <laughs> um, but um, his view about the, it, this was a very interesting um, uh, discussion because I had looked at a Chagask um, strategy document, the 2030 food strategy, which has a bit on tillage. But not much, really, because Chagas are all about the moo cows. Yeah, you they know, are. It's really focused on dairy. And one of the things Bobby said was, look, all, all, with all respect to Chagas, you know, tillage farmers aren't really getting a look in. I tried you know. and failed to get someone from Chagas to come and sit on this panel. Yeah. Nobody wanted to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. So there's something funny going on. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we, we basically, we, we, we are cultivating wheat here. Mm. Tillage farmers are cultivating wheat, but it's almost exclusively going to animal feed and distilling. Right. There is no Irish wheat, bar what these growers are doing, right? Wow. And, 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 and to, read the, to read the Chagas document is really interesting. It, it doesn't like, sound like Chagas have much dog in the fight in terms of improving that situation. Mm -hmm. We import two, so the distinction here is millable wheat. So that's millable wheat. You can make bread from it, right? We import 210 million tons of millable wheat a year. And where does right? it come from? Well, there's a really, so here's another bit, interesting bit about the grain world, right, is that um, you, you can buy a bag of Odlum's flour, right? Mm -hmm. It'll say milled in Ireland, mm -hmm. but that flour hasn't been grown in Ireland for 20, 25 years. Interestingly, Bobby's father used to supply flour to Odlum's in Port Arlington 25 years ago, but it is some years since Odlum's, that iconic Irish brand, mm -hmm. were milling any Irish wheat. Um, and you can't really tell where the traceability is very poor um, because it'll be now, you know, millers will blend flour, you know, mm. because different, you know, flour is very volatile and very dynamic. You know, if you get a wet harvest, you might have to blend it with something that came from a dry mm. harvest. So you get the protein and enzyme levels right and all sorts of stuff. So, um, uh, but it, it'll be, it'll be a mishmash. It'll be a bit of French flour, a bit of Italian flour, a bit from the Ukraine, a bit from mm. Canada. You know, you don't, you don't know really. You know. And so what do, do sorry, can oh, sorry, I ask, no, we do grow oats, don't we, here? We, we, we grow, grow farm oats. more oats. We, yeah. we, I, I looked at the Chagas numbers. We grow about double the amount of oats that we grow of wheat. Really? Yeah. And yet we eat far more wheat. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Sorry, sorry yeah. for interrupting there. Yeah. So is the Ukrainian situation going to affect... The, this is the, 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 the proximate cause of the proposed compulsory tillage scheme. Yeah that we're going to be failing to, to get the supply chain from Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. which also exports a great yeah. deal of grain, uh, is going to come to a grinding halt because of the, uh, the war. Um, is that likely to affect us? Well, I asked Bobby about the, the, right. the tillage incentives. You know, yeah. there's like 400 euros a hectare, mm. I think is what was announced in February. And, and I asked him, had there been any impact of that? And he said, yeah, there'll be a 6% increase in tillage year on year. But he said it's no good to tillage no. farmers because our mm -hmm. land is already in tillage, you know. So they felt like they were getting the, the rough end of the, the, the stick yeah. about it. Um, I, you know, I buy flour from a wholesaler. The price has remained relatively stable. It's crept right. a little bit. Um, I think there's a bit of kind of, I mean, I, who knows, you know. Like flour, wheat is, is, is traded as a kind of global commodity. So what, yeah. what will happen is, the supply squeeze in the Ukraine will just tr crank, up the price, crank up the price, regardless yeah. of where it's coming from, whether it's coming from America or Canada mm -hmm. or anywhere else. Yeah, of course. I, I didn't yeah. consider that. You're absolutely right. And 
do, this is my ignorance now, do, do Joss and Mooney and O'Brien still make bread here in Ireland? Oh, they do, yeah. They yeah, do. Yeah, so yeah. explain about the white slice pan. So, so the white slice pan is a technological marvel, mm. right? And I, and I do, I feel sort of churlish about speaking ill of it, actually. And I do, I do succumb to its squidgy charms myself oh, yeah. every now and then, you know. And, and let's face it, it's the bread. We all grew up on it. Like, didn't we all grow, grow up eating yeah. the slice yeah. pan? My mother wouldn't let it into the house. She would, really, no. yeah. I had lovely so, toast. So, so we loved it. You had soda bread. <laughs> Europe was dreadfully hungry in the period after World oh. War II, and for years and years, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and, of course, in Britain, they'd had what their version, which was called the National Loaf, which was equally mm. reviled, right? Mm. And so in 1961, some very clever food uh, scientists came up with a thing called the Chorleywood bread process. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that. Mm. And this was a way that you could take poor quality flour. Now, poor quality flour usually means low protein flour because it's the protein... It's the protein in this flour that opens it up and gives it lovely volume and things like that. So, so low protein flour is not as palatable. So, and that's of course what grew in the UK because similar climate to us, you need sunshine. You need lots of sunshine for the high protein flour. So they figured out a way to take this low protein, poor quality flour and turn it into fluffy white bread. And how they do that is that the, the flour goes into pretty much a centrifuge, right? And it is, it, is, it is agitated at extraordinary speeds, thousands and thousands of revolutions per minute. And it's basically whipped into something that probably looks more like mousse or meringue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in a commercial bakery, there'll be a mixer that will hold 300 kilos, right? And it'll, it'll mix that bread to completion in about four minutes. 300 kilos of bread in four minutes. This, this, this was... 36, 48 hours in the gestation. That's a big difference. Um, now, flour, though, is, doesn't like all that heat, right? Um, so to deal with that heat, you have to add stabilizers and emulsif emulsifiers and things to just keep, to keep the suspension, to keep this emulsion that it's become stable. And then the other thing is, is that those extremes of heat affect the color of the flour. So then you have to do things like chlorinate the flour, right? And then the other thing, now that's the chlorination of flour has gone now, but flour was being chlorinated up until um, relatively recently. Okay. Um, so, you know, having, 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 so, having subjected the flour to this kind of trauma, yes. <laughs> then you, lots of stuff needs to get added in to kind of keep it in one piece. Um, but but from, from, like baking bread starts... The water is the thing. The water is the catalyst. The water is the thing that gets all the enzymatic activity happening. So as soon as you're adding water, chemical reactions happen in your baking. In a, in a commercial bakery using the Chorleywood bread process, from the moment the water hits the flour to the moment that it's in its wrapper, it's three and a half hours, right? It's an extra. I mean, technologically, it's extraordinary. It's just there's a high price to be paid for it in other ways. So very little nutrition. Well... The commercial, well, one of the things they've, they do, of course, is they put all the nutritional value back in, you know, both the thiamine and the niacin. If you look at the wrapper mm -hmm. on your you slice pan, there's 27 ingredients, right? And they'll add the, all those mm -hmm. things in. So they're, they're adding things in that sort of got, that, that got degraded mm -hmm. in the process. But, of course, in the flour that comes out, all of those things are still there. Yes. You know, and actually, this business of Michael Pollan, the great food writer, said something quite wise about this about the Chorleywood bread method. In the, in the US, it's called wonder bread, or as I might call it, no wonder bread, <laughs> right? But, but actually, having degraded the product to make, it more, um, to make it more economical, to make it more attractive to the consumer in a very kind of neoliberal way, you add, you, you add the stuff in that you had to take out, yeah. Yeah. and you create a value around that. You say, we've improved it. Yeah. No, you haven't. No, you're just <laughs> you know? restoring what you yeah. loot yeah. with smithereens and, and, and I mean, the centrifuge. The, and the last thing to say about it is, is that, is that and, and I, I mean, I'd be very cautious about the whole debate around bread and, and health, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but certainly, you know, this white bread came into our diet relatively recently. I mean, it's not since the 1960s. Actually, the big innovation was roller milling, which was in the 1850s. And roller milling, this is a stone mill, but roller milling fundamentally takes a lot of that nutritional value out of the flour, right? So this sort of, I guess this was my reason for making all that historical context, like that the bread that sustained humanity for millennia looks like this and this and yeah, this. Yeah. The bread that we've been eating 
more recently is a sort of, in the long story of bread, it's a sort of an aberration. Okay, that's fascinating. But would think we have been able to, I mean, the 1850s method presumably was brought in so as to feed huge urban populations, was it? Who wouldn't have had the wherewithal to make yeah, bread themselves? Yeah. I, I mean, there's the demands of, I suppose, mass production. Are you sure. going to put a loaf on every table? Yeah. What I wanted to ask you was, the Charlie Wood method is the white sliced pan, but I remember really good white loaf bread that you'd cut with the bread yeah. knife. That yeah. was very like good. Like a batch loaf. Or even, or even just yeah. ordinary bread. You'd, we, you know, as I said, we weren't allowed sliced bread in our house, but there was a particular type of bread, McNamara's bread in Limerick, uh, that uh, John's, it was really good bread, and they were still producing it up to about 20 years ago. Yeah. And it was better than anything. Even when they sliced it, it was still good quality. So was it always used for all, do you think? Or well, no, I, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of the, the monoculture now, isn't it? Like loads mm. of bread-like products are made through the Chorley Wood method. Okay. You know, right, you know yeah. baguettes and things like oh, that. But really? Yeah, yeah. But, okay. but, and speaking of bread, we have some, don't we? Yes. Oh, yes, now, yes. Um, um, do you, you should mill that yeah. now. Well, I'll leave that see. at the end because it's very noisy. How oh, glorious yeah. it is. Yeah. Are they going to be able to see the... the well, people going to be able to show we'll them? do it at the end and people can go okay. and have a gap. I'm going to go and get the bread. Oh, here's the bread. Fantastic. Oh, very nice. One no. Nice um, in the audience. Machine, would you bring that round to the... Um, to the people and monogamy. We should break bread. Too. Breaking yeah. bread, yeah. isn't that lovely? I think we may we probably have one for everybody in the audience. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. <laughs> it's very delicious, let me tell you. I haven't had any yet, now I'm dying. Also. Well, well, Katrina, could I say something about the, the soda bread, right? Which, by, do. by the way, I'm not, I'm a very poor soda bread maker. I'm, I'd be sackcloth and ashes. I bet there's some demon soda bread makers here. Yeah, but this I'm is um, this is JP uh, McMahon's recipe for oh, innocent, really? innocent treacle of soda bread. Beer. Of of art beer, yeah, and and, and in a way, anir, some anir, I, I, and anir, and I I, yeah. I think this bread represents the anir. anir. Sorry, beg your pardon. God forgive me. No, it's grand. I know. If you get to hear about this, my name would be Maud. My mother's not quite. I I bought um, a packet of. I bought, bought a packet of flour in Tesco, a packet of whole wheat flour, and the recipe for soda bread on the side looked exactly like Maura Laverty's, which was right. basically flour, you butter know, milk, buttermilk, pinch of salt, soda. teaspoon yeah. of bread soda. Mm. But this, of course, um, contains, you know, various nuts and seeds, and it also has a bit of stout and a bit of treacle in it. Yum, and, yum, yum. And, and it's from JP's Irish cookbook. And, and in a way, I, I think this represents the sort of the, the evolution of yeah. Irish soda bread, because, yeah. I mean, I'd say those seeds, I'd say you couldn't get sunflower seeds and sesame seeds in Ireland in the 19th century. No, and the other thing is, um, for soda bread, cream of tartar, flex tartar, yeah. a very good thing, to, it helps the raising agent. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's funny, because I think when we're talking about Irish people eating soda bread from about the 1850s, I think that was nearly always white soda bread they were eating. Yeah. Mm. I think brown bread only comes in as a kind of a health brown soda bread, so, yeah. sort of a healthy thing in the 20th century and probably post-war, I think, in... in, in um, but that white soda bread would probably have been very good, you know? Yeah. But, uh, it's yeah. just extraordinary how we take it for granted, isn't it? You know, yeah. that, that this is the, the centre of our lives in lots of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was amazed when you told me about the, the, the ownership of the grains by these multinational oh, yeah. corporations. Yeah. Most people don't know that. I we didn't have know to that. support yeah. the local grain growers, the, yeah. the mm -hmm. seed savers. Yeah. Because uh, that's really important. Yeah. They, they uh, um, and, 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 you know, what the seed savers are up to, it's really interesting because I think it's quite... And it's not just happening in things like flour. It's mm. happening... There are loads of people opting out, you yeah. know. And, and, it, and it's a sort of... It's interesting because it's quite transgressive, you know. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it is an act of resistance to say, you know what, we're just people... I think we're all feeling very anxious about mm. food, you know, the, the traceability, the provenance of yes, it, yes. The, 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 the equality issues around how food is made, global inequalities between North and South. You know, when you, when you start to unpack it, it's, it's deeply problematic. It is. And, um, and I think these, what people like Tolov Bio and Seed Savers are doing, and it's a, it's a really long game, of course, because mm -hmm. it takes years yeah. Yeah. To, to bring these yes, varieties, yeah. um, like you know, to a point where you could cultivate them. And I think where we're at now with, with these flowers that are being grown here, I, to me, it's, a, it rem, it's probably a bit like, you know, 1979, right? Mm. Where 99.9% .9 of people in this country were eating Calvita yeah. because that was the only cheese. And there was 0.1% of people down in West Cork that were eating Malines, yeah. you know. It, so it's... 
the flour is probably where things like, you know, artisan cheeses were yeah. 20 or 30 years ago. But well, if it does as well as Irish cheese, it, it'll be some achievement, yeah. you know. Now, we have a little bit of time left for questions. I see there's a lady up there. Do we have a roving mic? Um, can you yell? Yeah, I won't shout at you. Okay. My name is Geraldine Williams, and I'm a member of the Soul Food Galway here. And oh, we recently had an event in May in Finnery's Mill out in Loch Ray. It's one of the, an old mill run by family and still complete intact. And the interesting thing is we organised to have uh, bakers from Coolfin Organic uh, Bakers in uh, Banagher. And we had a couple from Oak Forest Mills. Do you know them? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, interestingly, Pat is creating a strong flour that is 14% protein. And what he was saying, he's an absolute minefield about flour in this country, is that in terms of the rush that the Irish government gave recently about producing uh, wheat in this country, it's not possible. This is a learned exper ex an expertise that you need in tillage farmers to do. But the support, that one thing that came out of our day is two things. We've lost our self-sufficiency and our diversity and we need to be looking for more people to ask for Irish flour, that is artisanal Irish flour. But we have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And people have to look at that because they're going to be paying now for very cheap bread that has very little value in it and has a huge correlation of poor digestibility for people and nutritionally nothing in it is the beige diet. So the thing that from a slow food, uh, we are trying to promote that is... Diversity stays here in the country. Slow Food internationally has been always trying to keep the seeds outside of the conglomerates and provide it for people, especially in indigenous countries. That's all I want to say. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Any other questions or remarks that anyone would like to make about all of this? You're blinded with science. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary story. Up at the back there. Sorry, hold on a minute. For, hold on if you get the mic. You can buy flour in some of the supermarkets very cheaply, and then you can buy the adlums that's much dearer. And people say, oh, there's no difference. Mm. There has to be a difference. Yeah. Or is there a difference? I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I mean, I think Odlums is a very persuasive brand, isn't it? Like, it's a beautiful brand. It's very mm. iconic with the owl and it stuff, is. you know. Yeah. Um, too, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know because, I mean, if you, you know, if you pick up a packet of Odlums, you know, you have, you have the same traceability issues as if you buy the yellow pack flower in, you know, Tesco's or, you know, you don't know where it came from. You, you, you actually don't know, you know. Um, no, so I, I don't know. Here. I don't know. But, but I mean, if you're a baker and you bake with it and... You feel it yeah, performs I, better. Than I feel that it's much finer. Yeah. You know, the, the cheaper flour is much finer. I'd prefer to buy the Adlams. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you're a keen baker, by the way, you can always, you know, Kells, Kells Whole Meal in Kilkenny, you know, do a fantastic range of flours in 16 kilo bags. And you'll feel like the business with a 16 kilo bag in your kitchen. <laughs> you're really, you're really <laughs> serious good, baker. You know? Yeah. And they have a great range and they have a lot of Irish flours as well. Okay, yeah. sir. There you go. I had a question. So... I feel like um, <clears throat> culturally, based on my accent, this might be too down the middle here, but uh, so my understanding of the Industrial Revolution is that it was solving a problem with bread that, you know, we wanted to make it more cheaply and more widely available, like, um, like I think it was mentioned that have bread on every table and, and everything like that. And so um, with some of these more local wheats that might be, um, you know, harder to produce because they each are in, in large quantities, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a way that we can combine what we've learned from the Industrial Revolution about making things more widely available, making things less expensive, but also keep that traditional, um, the things that made bread great? Uh, originally, which is just the, the simple in ingredients and everything like that. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, but I, I think something like the Charlie Wood method that you described sounds quite 
you know, I mean, people, they were getting, cheap bread was available before then. People were still buying cheap bread. So, you know, maybe the rolling system that you described com coming in in the 1850s, maybe that wasn't necessarily the worst either, you know. Um, maybe it's about the quality of the flour. And um, it's true, I mean, a white, a fresh white sliced pan, um, you know, they say you can actually take a, take a slice of it and crumble it in your hand and it goes into a little white ball. You can do that, you know, and it's it's awful, you know. But on the other hand, if you let it go stale for a few days, it's edible, you know. And I mean, actually, I think bread is nicer anyway when it's about a day old or two days old. I think it's more edible and it's more digestible. Um, so as to answer your questions, can, yeah, there is the problem of mass production. It goes back to the old problem again of, you know, the industrial revolution and the production of cheap food was an attack on the farmers, of course. It was the industrial populations becoming more, the, the prices becoming more important, the prices for buying foodstuffs becoming more important than the prices that you pay the growers. So, you know, it, there, will be, there would be some sort of a trade-off. I'm afraid I don't know. It would be great to think that you could preserve the quality and have it cheap as well. Maybe if you didn't have big corporations owning it, maybe if it was nationalised. I mean, the me, price yeah. of bread used to be fixed in France That's and right, in, yeah. in Europe, like That's up, right, to, yeah. up to the, the, the price of bread would be fixed uh, in every little locality, in every town mm. hall, you know, and that's when people would riot. People often think bread riots were mob violence, but they were very carefully controlled mm. um, demonstrations about the price of bread. So, you know, may, maybe we need more government control. Perhaps that's, anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, but in the I, I, end, I think Jerry? The, 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 and the lady from Slow Food raised the kind of self-sufficiency qu question, which I'm, I'm not entirely sure about. You know, like, you know, the English make their own wine, but I'm not sure it's any good. You know, um, <laughs> Certainly not at the moment. Yeah, and you, and you know, we could, we, could probably, we could probably have a go at making olive oil here, but it'd probably be terrible, you know. And, and so we, we have things, we, we make some extraordinary food items here, like our butter, there's, there's just yeah, nothing like our butter. Our dairy products. So our, the world wants our butter. We, we trade in the world via our butter, you know, and I think that, that um, uh, so I, I, you know, and flour has been, it has been traded globally for centuries now, you know, and trade is, trade is generally a good thing. I think one of the questions you get into about, you know, when you start to look at the complexity of the food system, you know, through the bread prism, and you start asking yourself questions like, okay, self-sufficiency, that's not really a runner, is it? Because actually getting to a point where <coughs> there's a living in it for tillage farmers, right? You know, that's a big question. Yeah. Is there a living in it for tillage farmers, right? Um, that's one question. Um, uh, I, I, and so, you know, we, we've got self-sufficiency, which is no trade, and then we've got us importing 210 million tonnes of flour every year, which is way too much trade. So what's the right amount of global trade? What's the sustainable amount of global trade? And I think that's the key question around loads of these kind of naughty food problems. Yeah. We need global trade, but what is the right amount of yeah. it? Yeah, that's, that's very well put. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. Oh, there's a gentleman up at the back. Maybe just give him the last word there. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been a very informative and very productive talk, so thank you very much, all three of you. Um, I have two observations on, based on what you have talked about. One is that I feel that listening to you, we've lost, as a country, uh, as a result of the EU, as, uh, we've lost a bit of independence because we're not allowed to grow what we would like to grow. We are being told by the EU what certain standards are to be. And in some ways, that could be a good thing. But listening to, I suppose, what's happening to Ukraine, you know, maybe that should be questioned uh, again. The second observation I, I had was that having our, uh, our grain and wheat controlled by five corporations doesn't sound like a very good thing for uh, the future stability of our food. And I was just wondering, could you add a little bit of light on who these five corporations are, who controls them? Because in essence, <coughs> those four five corporations really control what we eat. Yeah. As you say, Stafford. bread is our stable diet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, I, 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 somebody who's written about it recently is George Monbiot, actually. Yeah. So I'd refer you to um, so, something he wrote in The Guardian this yeah. week, actually, about what, you know, you know food plutocracy and stuff. And uh, actually, Oxfam have just done a very significant 
report on the ABCD companies. Okay. Um, and I and I and actually I think it's kind of an it is analogous to big oil yeah. and big tech. And you know these huge existential questions that we face as societies, we're not going to move the dial on them while those entities are yeah. fighting to maintain. The and they must be making a lot of money. They're making a lot of money. Wouldn't be so interested in clinging onto it. And you mentioned intellectual property. As it's well. intellectual property. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. But, but I mean, Mon Monsanto holds the IP on. Most of the tomatoes that you eat in the supermarket. God. Really? Um, How depressing. <laughs> um, 